So my name is Thomas. I'm a former gastronomer. I'm a graphic designer. I'm a nutritionist. I did a lot of things in my life. I have a math, physics, and chemistry high school degree, and I actually wanted to study physics. But life came a little different, and 10 years ago, I founded a company for holistic water purification. And my really passion is, is water. I give talks about water for about like 10 years now. And at one talk a few years ago, one called me a water philosopher. So today I want to try something with you and we're gonna do a mix, a mix between a science perspective of water and some philosophical understandings and point of view about water. I hope you're gonna like it. So I have to put this. So, if you talk about kombucha, I think it's obvious for everyone here that we're talking about a living substance. And that's a very interesting thing because if you talk about life and living, then water is so close. I mean, usually it's so obvious, but because it's so obvious, we don't think about it that much. So when we actually then talk about life, what comes next? The metabolism. Because the metabolism is the one thing that connects living matter or living substances, and it's the chemical reaction within plants, animals, humans, and actually bacteria, microbes, and anything that is living, it separates it from that matter. So when you think about uh, metabolism, we know that there is an anaerobic metabolism, which means it works without oxygen. But there is no metabolistic process without water. And that makes the water so a key essential point. So why is there nothing, why can nothing grow or nothing like really live without water? And we're talking about kombucha and we have the metabolistic process of bacteria, yeast and so on. We need to think about that water. And I try to come a little closer and deeper in, in that point. So, so I have like two computers there, so I'm confused. Um, if we talk about like water, it's a very, very basic molecule actually. It's like two hydrogen and oxygen. And actually it should not be a gas, it uh, should not be like a liquid at all. It usually should be a gas if it would follow the normal rules of chemistry. So what is actually the weirdest thing we have in the universe was recently quoted by the BBC and I really liked that they had a, like a two minute movie just about water and I was like really surprised because similar to kombucha, I think it's something that people have been not so much focusing on in the past years like on water and now science comes more and more and digs deeper into it and says like wow, I mean like water doesn't follow the normal rules of chemistry. So for example, like I said, it shouldn't be a liquid at all. Water actually, if you think about it, expands when it freezes. I mean, it's normal for us, but by the rules of chemistry, it should not do like that. So, and if you think about in the way how we have our life on our planet, if ice would not float because water expands when it freezes, there would not be, have been possible to life to start in the seas, underwater. So there are so many different um, anomalies, they're called in science, where water behaves differently, and this, ma this makes water so interesting. Another one, for example, to give you a third one, is that hot water freezes faster than cold water, which is also really, really interesting. And if we really think about like water at all, I mean, we have 70% of water on our planet, we have 70% of water in our bodies. If you think about any beverage, it's mostly like 98, 99% of water. So it's very obvious to think about that and now we're gonna see a little bit from the science perspective. But first I wanna um, tell you why I was so interested in how that started in water and give you a small story about that. Here you see me, 2006, the only white guy there in China training martial arts. Uh, that was like one of my teenage dreams to go into China and train their martial arts in the Wudang Mountains. And I did that 2006 after I did my, my um, high school degree. I did that very late. And since I was a teenager, I was very fascinated with Chinese culture, philosophy, and the Chinese stories. And if you look into kombucha, then you also see 
that the Chinese have the kombucha in their story. I did a little bit of research, so far as I could research, is very unclear where the kombucha really came from. But what I found is that actually in China, the kombucha was known 2,000 years ago. And the kombucha tea fungus was said that they were doing drinks with it, and if you drink that tea, it grants eternal life. So already in the Chinese philosophy and old stories, the kombucha had their a place in the history. And there's a, a story about a tea competition done in China. And at the tea competition, two farmers met. The one had the better tea, obviously, but the other one, he went up the mountains and he got the best water from the glaciers. And actually, the one with the better water, he won the contest. And if you also then look a little bit more in what Chinese history or Chinese stories tell about water and tea, is that you always have to do the tea to, to make it its best with the water closest to the place where the tea plant grows um, naturally. So because of the water and the minerals they have it in it, they not just only by the taste and the regionally flavors and pH, also the electromagnetics, and I'm gonna show you some pictures about that in a few minutes, they really work with the plant there. They are in resonance. And we're gonna see more about electromagnetics in a few minutes. So actually, why is now water so important? Or why is the spring water so important and so different? If you think about like 2,000 years ago, I would say there have not been any residues in the water the farmer from the village took uh, compared to the water the guy took when he went up the mountains. So what is the difference in a water to a spring water? And to understand that, we have to look a little bit closer to the natural water cycle and how water cycles on our planet. And there we go a little bit into the philosophy of the Chinese. So if you want to start a chemical process, we always need some energy. And here we have the sunlight. So what happens is that the water here, it vaporizes up. And then up here, you have different processes that happen. You have like cosmic radiation, sun radiation, you have like light, you have expansion, so you have different qualities. And if you would look at it like the Chinese um, from the philosophy, it would be the yang process. It's a male process, the yang. And if you have a yang water, which is very active and aggressive, and it would, if you would measure it, it would have a very low pH. So if you would put it in the wrong vessels, it would like eat them up. So if you take the water and it goes down, it enters the earth, and what happens here, you have a totally different, the opposite side of this process. You have like magnetic fields, you have, um, you have minerals, you have carbon, you have like um, density, you have coldness, you have no light. It's the total opposite of it. So the Chinese would say for this, it's the yin process, it's the female part of the whole cycle. And when something is ready, when something has both qualities of life, the yang and the yin, it becomes whole. We all know this yin-yang sign, which has both qualities in it. And if you would look at this like a vegetable or like a fruit, for example, when the apple is ready, it falls off a tree. But the water does totally different, and so that's so interesting. When water is ready, it comes up like a spring water. Water really goes opposite of gravity and goes up. And that's a very special process because of something which changed within the water. It can react differently on the outside. Because water, when you look at it, a good water from a not good water, they look the same because it yet has nothing. And that especially is then what makes what you do with it different because it just provides a different, um, a different way. And this is actually how it looks like. The water from a spring, the water I described, is highly structurized. This is a picture of the molecules, how they form. It's called a cluster. And if you think now, okay, maybe that's interesting, but how the heck shall that have, that have any difference on my kombucha or my drink or whatever, I'm gonna give you an example. This is two different structures of carbon. Do you know what that is, anybody? Very good, you get an A plus. 
That was graphite and a diamond. So if you look back, it's both the same. Just the rearrangement of the atoms make a graphite where you can write with it to diamond where you can cut with it. We're not talking about the, the value. We as people give it value. It's just about how it reacts and its physical properties. And there you see it's a very different uh, thing you have just by rearranging from a hexagonal, a hexagonal structure of carbon to a tetrahedric st uh, structure of carbon. So the structure is actually much more important than the chemical's composition. And I talked before about some frequency pictures, and here they are. This is a biofrequency analysis of a tap water. You see it has no clear arrangement in the frequencies, no clear order. It's, you could say it's chaos. And when you go to a spring water or to a structured water, you have a water which is very well ordered, which has clear ground frequencies and a very, very good electromagnetics. And this works because if you think about any metabolistic process, in the end, it's bioelectricity. So if you have the water with the wrong electromagnetics, it will not work with your um, microbes. So, with the structure of the water, now we're getting a little bit more practical, also things change of that very basic liquid. The surface tension changes with the structure, the electrical charge, what I just described. Also the solvent properties of the water change, which become very interesting for you if you want to do drinks with it. And finally, it becomes a living liquid, the water itself. How can you do a living beverage in a dead liquid? That will not work. So if you want to have a water as the base of your drink, which usually drinks are, we usually don't look at the water as its quality. We just take the water as it is because it's water. But water is not just water. Water can be very, very different. But like, as, but like I described a few minutes ago, you can't see it. It's hidden within the water itself. Here you see an example of how it looks like when you have a solvent material which is structurized in the water. So the water rearranges itself by the electrical charge, no matter what you have, like a microbe, a protein, a mineral, a nutrient, anything you have, anything has a, an electric charge. And because water is a dipole, it has a plus and a minus, actually one minus and two plus poles. The water you see here arranges around. So there is not one water in the body which is alone and you don't have like any uh, mineral, for example, which is alone somewhere in the water. It's always a combination because the electrical charge of the water in combination with the electrical charge of the mineral, they form a geometry. And that is very unique for any composition you can have within your body or any metabolistic process where's water obviously involved. To say this with the words of Professor Rustam Roy, the structure of the water is much more important than its chemical composition. And even if the structure of water now becomes more and more important in modern science, it's still controversial. Because, like I said, you can't see it. It's very hard to measure it. You need to go into electromagnetics and you need to do a little bit of um, very, very hard um, testings to get like clues about how water is behaving. But what you can do is you can look and have a phenomenological point of view about something. And that becomes very interesting when you work with living matter because you can give a plant or a flower, for example, um, different water and then you see how they grow. For example, if you have your good structured water, the plants or the flowers you have in them, they last a week. If they're cut, they last a week longer. So think about you doing a drink, a living drink, we're talking here, with a water, if you would put uh, flowers in it, which would last at least a week longer. That would make your drink much better, wouldn't it? So, like I said, the plant growth is very much infected by the structure and the quality of the water. 
the minerals and the nutrients in plants, we've been doing tests with a, with a school for plants, and when they work with the right water, they have a higher um, a nutrition quality like a, a level within the plants. They did it with tomatoes, for example, and they had an average higher uh, growth rate of the tomatoes. The color and the taste of the beverage also obvious like will change with a good quality of water and also the smoothness, the way how it really tastes. And, which I guess is very important for anyone who does food, the shelf life of food, and like I just described, of flowers, really extends. And we have feedback of people who work, for example, with our water systems, that they don't have so much problems when they want to stay in a raw quality of the product, and you don't pasteurize or so on, that the, the food really lasts much longer, and you don't have any, any problems with, um, with mold formation. And in the end, the good water really helps to your product to have a very, very good lifetime. And to bring it full circle, what I just said, the metabolism in the beginning really depends on water. And if you have the right water quality, then all metabolistic processes work very, very efficiently. Make a small jump away from the structure just for a second. Don't forget the quality of the water from a chemical perspective. We know that agriculture and industry are affecting our quality of water more and more. And the tap water is not the quality we had, I don't know, like 50, 100 years ago. Still, we can say to have a quality of tap water, even that I have a water company, I say it's very good compared to the rest of the world that we have a very good water we can drink and we don't get sick from it um, uh, instantaneously. But if you think about having raw products done with it, then you really get a problem. Uh, then you really get a problem because the processes with raw products really don't work that good. If you have a tap water, and especially the chemicals within the water, and we have like hormones, pesticides, heavy metal, lead, and so much, so much more in the water, only in very, very small doses. But we are talking about very, very, very small cells who are gonna need the water to develop. So even these very, very small residues found in the water can influence the quality of your drink. So to sum it up, one point I forgot, good, I have my notes. If you want to filter your water and you use it for a beverage like a kombucha, for example, don't use a filtration which takes out the minerals. There are different ways to filter water. The thing is, if you take out the minerals of the water, you remember the cycle I just described? If you take out the minerals, you just have a yang water, which means it's too low in the pH, it's too aggressive, and it's not stable, which means it work, will not work properly with the metabolistic processes because it doesn't have both uh, sides of its, um, of its life cycle, which makes it very, very stable and that you can see mainly in the pH and in a way how it works with, uh, in the reaction with different materials, that it is not so aggressive. So we come back to the kombucha. Kombucha is not just a drink. I have no clue about kombucha actually. I just have, I think I know a little bit about water, but I know something about the kombucha I said in the beginning. It is a living drink. And what I wanted to show you from more like a science philosophic perspective is in water is so much more in it and water is the basis of life. Really described in this very beautiful BBC um, two minutes is like, you can really think about when we say like 4.6 billion years ago, the water came on our planet. Much later, like really much later, life started on our planet. So scientists nowadays even say very clearly that with the water here on Earth arriving, the possibility for life itself arrived here. Which means if we want to work with something living, everything we know here is connected to water. And if you want to do a product which is really beneficial for what you're, what you're thinking of being with the kombucha for your, for your customers. I think the water quality is very, very crucial for, for any drink uh, like, like kombucha, for example. And if you think about this great competition where the Chinese guy went up 
and got his spring water for the tea competition and he got and, and he won. I can just summarize that the water is not just any ingredient of your kombucha. It is really the basic condition for your kombucha. And if you, if you give it the right attention, I'm very, very sure if you find your water which, which fits best for you and maybe you have the chance to have a production somewhere where you have a natural spring, that would be actually the, 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 best, uh, the best way to do your kombucha. I think you can really, really, really give the, the, the most impact into your kombucha if you focus on the water first. To give a little thanks to some of our clients who gave me some feedback, I hope you know some of them, like we have a happy cheese, which is like a fermented cashew. Great kombuchas here from Berlin, I love them all, four of them, and friends of mine who do the beer brewery with our vitalized water, which is also really nice. So thanks to all of them. These are like clients of us who do really awesome products with our water. And I just want to say thank you with my favorite quote from Bruce Lee. Be water, my friend, and I hope um, my talk will be of benefit for you. Thanks.